Lots of people. We've been waiting on you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, it took me forever to get this thing up and running. It was being difficult. I think it would have done it on Monday because that was the 1st of April. <laughs> oh, there's Cody. How's your kidney stone? I think you're muted. There you go. Now we all know you have kidney stones. <laughs> you can use all the sympathy you can get, right? Oh, yeah, I'll take it. Okay. All right, let me see here. I need to get me up and let's see. All right. Let's get as much of the board up there as possible. That's probably enough. Okay, we are recording. Good deal. All right, All right first thing I wanted to cover, uh, wait a minute. Before I forget this, let me get everybody. Uh, let's see. Present, present. Let's see. Who else? Is that really a dark one? Oh, Hannah. Not a lot of light in your room, is there? No, it's backlit. That's the problem. You got light coming in from behind you. I can't see your face. And then uh, Julianne. Let's see, who are we missing? Missing Destiny and Sasha. Okay. All right, first thing I wanted to, uh, first point I wanted to hammer has to do with assignments. What you need to do is take the schedule, the new schedule, and check your assignments. I guess this applies to uh, the lab, right? Because we don't have any assignments in here, except for exams. <clears throat> and check your my grades in Blackboard. And if there's an assignment in there that doesn't have a grade, or could have a zero grade, either way, um, and on your schedule in the syllabus it says that it's due, then you need to get that in as soon as possible. Otherwise, I have to record it as a zero, and uh, well, you got till May fourteenth before I have to turn the grades in. That's when the chicken, huh? Is our grade um, in this class on Blackboard? Should be, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. But uh, I update it at least a couple of times a week, and especially if we have an exam. Uh, by that evening, I'll have the, the your grade updated with the exam grade in there. Okay, so we're going to do some more review today. And what I'm hoping is that you guys have had a chance to look at those review problems and give me stuff to work on rather than, I don't want to just stand up here and talk all the time. Uh, while you're thinking, I'm going to put some identifying information on the board so the uh, the recording will pick it up. Yeah, this is uh, chapter seven, is it? Seven. Yeah, seven. Exam five, seven. Chapter seven. Uh, this is actually part two. Okay. So where are we having trouble?
Did I have any trouble at all? No? Well, let's see. Oh, I have a question on 24. That's a good place to start. 24. Okay. Uh, which of the following is not determined by the principal quantum number n in the hydrogen atom? All right. Let's see. I probably in the did I put in some of them? some of them I actually skipped and didn't put in there. This one's here. Okay, good. All right. How about a? Does n relate to the energy of the electron? Oh yeah, that's what the principal quantum number means, is the energy level of the electron. Well, that was true. We could even say it's equal to n, or um, related to n, let's say that. It's not really equal to n. We can use n to find out what the energy is, can't we? Remember that formula? Remember where to find it. That's better. It's in the back. <clears throat> the minimum wavelength of the light needed to remove the electron from the atom. All right. Actually, uh, minimum energy to, uh, there's another way to say it to promote the electron from N to infinity. That's what that means. To ionize, to remove the electron from the atom. Uh, that's what it would take. And that is related to that formula, actually. Not too many pages in this document. Okay, so that's the energy of the electron at that n equals whatever. And the amount of energy required to remove it is the an energy of the uh, final position minus the energy of the initial position. This one is going to be the infinity position, and this one's going to be like related to n. Right? So uh, if we say n is infinity, anything divided by infinity is zero, is right? So that term drops out, and then it's really just equal to in. Okay? And since this is a minus and within the E is another minus, it's a positive value. What that means is when we do that calculation, we get a positive number and based on our convention. Positive numbers are energy added to the atom. So when you add energy to the atom of that amount, you get the electron ejected completely. It's ionized. Okay? So that was true. So what does C say? Say that three times fast. The size of the corresponding atomic orbital. Remember the definition. When I was um, 
describing all the quantum numbers. This one refers to not just the energy, but the size. So it's part of the definition. Right? So if you say n equals 1, it's like this. n equals 2, like that. n equals 3, like that. So that was true. That's it. Uh, the shape of the corresponding atomic orbital. Does Ian say anything about the shape? Not a thing. No, we have another, we have a different <coughs> number for shape. This one. L says the shape. If L is zero, what shape is it? Spherical, right? If L is one, kind of dumbbell, right? And two, and this is S, P, D. If it's D, then it gets a little more complicated. Some of them is dumbbell, and some of them have dumbbell plus a donut. Remember that picture? And three, uh, it's even worse. <laughs> right, that's why I don't I talk about it very much. So this one is the false one. And just to be complete, uh, E is all of the above are determined by N. All of the above are determined. Wait a minute. That means there are two false ones in here. Was that your problem? No, I didn't realize that. <laughs> so that's a bad question. Right. So uh, actually, it should be if I want to. The easiest correction to this problem answers is instead of all of the above are determined by n, say none of the above are determined. By n. Well, then it's false, right? It's both false. All right, I have to put something else in e. But the one that's exactly wrong is D. And then E encompasses. Because all of the above are not determined by N. Because we just said D is not. Okay, so I have to work on that one. <laughs> okay. Came on pretty good. It's probably because this is fresh. Okay. My guess is that the ones requiring just simple calculations are not going to give you any trouble. It's the ones where you have to dig in and, and be logical about your approach. Which one is wrong, which one's right, all the above, none of the above. Those kind take a lot of effort. <coughs> Any others? Why was Mendeleev given the most credit for the concept of periodic table? Forty-one. Boil down to one word: prediction. He was able to predict not only that there would be elements in that position. Where Yeah, where would they? Where would they be? And what are their chemical and physical properties? He was able to predict those two. Was well, he the first one that tried to develop a periodic table? Mendeleev? I need to be on camera. <clears throat> I, know that, Remember, I know his wasn't like that. You said his was... His was 90 degrees. Was, yeah. right? The first one was. The second iteration, he, he turned it 90 degrees. Remember the triads? Oh, yeah. yeah, the triads. 
uh, Doberheimer came up with the triads. So he, chemists were starting to recognize that there were similarities among certain of the elements, and Mendeleev just took it to its ultimate conclusion. Actually, no, it wasn't Doberheimer. Um, okay. Are you talking about number 40? 41. Number 40 asks who is oh. the first chemist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was done right. Oh, I'm thinking of Meyer. Okay. Meyer actually tried to put a periodic table together. Dober, Doberiner was the triads. That's right. That's correct. But Meyer, uh, Lothar Meyer, proposed a uh, periodic table, but his he didn't try to use it to predict. He just slapped them on the page and said, there it is. So he was the first, Meyer was the first? Actually, they were simultaneous. That happens a lot in science. I, it's strange. Um, I don't, know, I don't know what it is about some great leaps that we make. You get two or more people that are doing it at the same time. It's like, who gets to the patent office first? <laughs> it happened with Alexander Graham Bell. I can't remember who his competitor was, but um, they both filed. He and his competitor filed for a patent on the telephone. Uh, I think it was. Yeah, the telephone. And uh, he just happened to be a few minutes ahead. So we have Ma Bell instead of Ma, whatever the other guy's name is. So a number 40, would that be Meyer or? Oh, no, don't worry. He, he recognized the uh, triads. Right. If the question had been, uh, what other person developed here out of faith? Medical laboratory Yeah, I was Uh, let's see. Forget. You guys have any questions? Okay. Is that concrete block or does it have a glaze on it? <laughs> it's gone. Okay. It's concrete block. I was like, uh, there you go. Oh, wow. British outlet right there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's uh, 240 volts, right? Yeah. I think 50, so. 50 hertz, 240 volts. Hopefully yep. it's not frying my computer. Be sure and carry your uh, converters with you. Okay. What else? Let's see if we can find any others that are lurking in here. There's another question, like, would you say that would be a lot to think about in 45? Yeah. Quantum theory? Which of the following statements about quantum theory is incorrect? All right. Let's see. Energy and position. Energy and position cannot be determined. Instead of the big word, I'm going to use small word. At the same time. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Who said it was true? Guy's name was Eisenberg. It's known as the uncertainty principle.
Okay, that's true. Can't find both of them at the same time at the quantum level, right? With things get really small. When they get big like us, yeah, you can figure them both of them out at the same time. Uh, let's see. Lower energy orbitals are filled with electrons before higher energy. So, lower E fill first. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Electrons want to be at the lowest possible energy they can under current conditions. So, for instance, if you're at room temperature and pressure, uh, those are fairly benign conditions. So uh, any element will want to have its electrons at their lowest possible energy level. So we put the electrons in at level one, and we move up to level two if all the ones are taken, and we move up until we run out of electrons. That's true. What is it called when all the electrons in an atom are at their lowest energy level? It's called the ground state. So whenever you see ground state, I mean the electrons have not been promoted above the lowest possible energy level. Um, C. When filling orbitals of equal energy, two electrons will occupy the same orbital before filling a new orbital. That's too much to write. Let's see. Uh, all right. Let's say equal energy. Equal energy electrons will occupy the same orbital. Will enter same orbital uh, before uh, for next. Orbital. Is that true or false? That one's the possible. Yeah. Does it each orbital have different levels that they can have? Right. That's Hun's rule. Hun's rule refutes this one. So, for instance, uh, let's do oxygen. So, if you have oxygen with eight electrons, So there's four. We have four electrons that can go into the P. How many can the P hold? Six. It has three sublevels and two electrons in each one. So we put in four, we go like that, like that, like that. Then we can go back and start pairing them up. Right. Just think of it this way. Electrons don't particularly like each other. Right. They repel because they're all negative. So we try to put them as far apart from one another as possible. Put them in this one and then that one and then that one. Then we're forced to go back and pair them up. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see if we can find a mistake with G. No two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. No two electrons same for one numbers. Is that true? Get this out of the way. I'm going to say yes because it's going to be wrong. Right. <laughs> That's a good test taking technique. <laughs> We've already got this one out of the way, so that one has to be true. But it is true. This is the Pauli exclusion principle.
No two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. They could have the same N, they could have the same L, they could have the same N sub L. If that's the case, then this one has to be different. So one would be plus one half, and the other would be minus one half. But they all have, they have to have a different set of quantum numbers. <clears throat> so we've covered a lot. I mean, we've got Heisenberg and Hahn and Pauli. We've even got a discussion of the ground state in that one question. And he says all are correct, so it has to be false. So, so with the ones, so like the other one did one strong and even strong as well. So if we would pick the one that was not E, right? That would be the one that yeah. was this, this would be the best answer, yeah. That's my, uh, I guess that's, that's my cop out. <laughs> I always pick the best answer. <clears throat> that would probably need some work too. You know what I'll do is is actually make something up to go in that place. Actually, it'd have to be true because we already got a false one in there. Or I can put those statements together as like Roman numeral one, two, three, four. And then have A, B, C, D, E, and then uh, which are true, like one, two, one and three, two and four. Really try to spin your head around. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. Have any trouble uh, drawing electron configurations? Do you think you could do an electron configuration using a periodic table? Because that's the quickest way to do one. Let's take an example. Well, maybe I should see if we can find one in here. That would be better. About 51 people. 51. And it has to go about an element table. How many electrons are in the Germanium. Right? Yeah. Germain. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. We can do that one. Uh, GE. One. Um, so the question is, germanium has um, so many electrons in the 4p orbital. Electrons in the 4p orbital. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one to work with. So you gotta find germanium. That is that like where you have like all the one S, the D and the P, like you get down the diagonal. Is that how you do that? Uh, if you right, you can use that method. You know, you can use that one if you don't want to look at the periodic table. That's that's right. But if you got the periodic table and you have this question, find germanium. Right, there's germanium right there. Okay. This is where the P orbitals are being filled. Right. Oh, you guys can't see that, can you? Let's try that. There we go. So here's germanium, and the P orbitals are being filled here. Right. So there's N equals one, two, three, and four. And for the P orbitals, they actually correspond with the P's correspond with four, so this is four P right here. If you're over here, then this is three D. Okay, you have to know that. Four P, so four P one, four P two. Two electrons in the four P. It's just that simple. So would there be six in the Yes. Right. 
Oh, no gases are easy. You just fill the peas up all the way. <laughs> Each one of these has, well, that one has two, of course, the duets. But all of these have six in their outer P orbital. This is 4P. 5P is full here. 6P is full there. Okay. Um, how many valence electrons? Does germanium have? Take the highest energy n, so n equals four, and you say germanium's got four s two and two p two, so valence electrons is four. Okay. Oh. Yeah, this is four. 4s2. So it's got two electrons here. And then over here we've got two p electrons. So it has four valence electrons. Those are the electrons that are available for bonding. Let me check my periodic table here and see. Okay. It could form a plus two plus four. If it lost all those electrons, it'd be a plus four. But it's also possible minus four. And that's because it's right here in the middle, in the carbon family. So you could either subtract four electrons to go that way, or you could add four electrons to go that way. So do you use all the groups at the end of the periodic table where you find them? Yeah. So like you said G E go to all the way to the next one and then you know, here that. So you just all go to the end? To find the number of valence electrons? Yeah. Yeah. You want to be at the highest energy level, so N equals four. So we take these two from the P, those two from the S's, they're all fours. So those are your valence electrons. Now if we wrote out um, 4s2, we would be filling 3d10 and then 4p2 like that. And then our, our core would be uh, argon. Right. So the temptation is to say, oh, we have uh, 14 valence electrons. Well, we don't because the d orbital is completely filled. Right? And it's actually at a lower energy. So we take, um, if we're going to lose electrons, the first two we lose are B. So that would give you a two plus charge. Then if we need them, we take away these two, that would be four plus. But if you wanted to go the other direction to krypton, then you would add four more electrons to that one, which would make it four minus. Okay, and in fact, the periodic table in your document has four minus first. And they usually put the, the preferred ion first. So if germanium is ionized, it will tend to go toward this one first. But the other two are available if the conditions are right. Okay. I remember in the 11th grade, they would always. Uh, Tell us to go from board model and to know like, all the ones that are filled and then subtract whatever is left over. And I'm coming, you know, I do the yard for it. Oh, okay. Well, okay, this is actually derived from the board model. Yeah, that's, that's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Periodic table is your friend. So we have another one we want to play with. That was, uh, what was that? Erased 51? 51. So we 
Okay, titanium has how many in its dual ring? Titanium. Here we go, titanium. Yes? Has two in its dual ring. Um, let's see. How about 52? See, is that still? Yeah, it's still on the board. Iron has so many electrons that are unpaired in its d orbitals. And we're looking for unpaired, unpaired electrons in the d orbital. Okay. So we need to say, where's iron? Okay, iron's here with 26. Okay. We can go back and say start with argon. Then we can come over here and say uh, four S two. Then we have three D, and uh, that would be a, we have six more, right? So we have six in the D orbital, and let's check that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Six are in the in iron's d orbitals. But in order to say how many are unpaired, we need to go in here and say there are five suborbitals at the M sub L level in D. That's why D can have ten, two each, maximum. And then we say, how do those six go in? Well, normally we would say one, two, three, four, five, six. And that would give us four electrons. Unpaired. Now, just for argument's sake, suppose we went back, um, let's see. Magnes would be one less, so we just take one away and that'd be five unpaired. How about chromium? Chromium is 24. This one's, this one's a curveball. Okay, so chromium, we could. Go to argon again. That means we have uh, six, six electrons. And then we say four S2, and then three uh, D4. That's, that's the way we would normally fill it. The fact of the matter is, This is the lower energy state to have five electrons in the d orbital. That means we take one away from here, put it over there. Okay, chromium is strange that way. So chromium would have five unpaired electrons, just like manganese. So we steal one from the S to make chromium. Half filled orbitals are lower energy than uh, partially filled with paired. So would you do the same thing with V, 10, and C? These? Yeah. No, you just fill those up as normal. Okay. Right. Because it, it takes too much. Uh, stealing both of the S electrons would, would uh, destabilize it too much. V three, Right. One, two, three, and then this will be five, five. This will be six, seven, eight. Then when you get to copper, we do the same thing, a similar thing. We say copper twenty nine. Uh, okay. 
and take the argon. Three D. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see. 18 would be 11, right? So we normally say 2 and 9, right? Yeah. But similar argument. Uh, either half filled or fully filled is more stable. So we take one away from here, make that one 10, and just fill it all the way up. So the S orbital has uh, one electron. And then of course when you go to zinc next, you just plop that one back in here and you have that one full, that one full, and you're at this position. Or what? Overly stable. Stable. Reasonably, yeah. Uh, and then we go check to see what the uh, what the ions are formed. Zinc forms a two plus, copper forms a two plus or a one plus. So in order to form a one plus for copper, you take that electron. A two plus, we'd have to take one of these. But for zinc, um, it would have two here. So we would take, uh, I don't know, we'd probably take the one, one electron from the S orbital. It'd be easier to take that one than it would be to take the D. I know you guys can hear me. Can you hear any of the other comments? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I can, I can, I can check the mic. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I got the mic. Yeah, the mic's turned all the way up, so that's the best we can do. <clears throat> okay. One twenty. Yeah, twenty five minutes. Let's see if we can find any other weirdos in here. How about um, periodic trends? Like uh, number seventy six. Okay. Which of the following statements is false? There's another one. E says all are true. Well, maybe they are all true. Let's see. So A says a sodium atom has a smaller radius than a potassium atom. Sodium. Is less than potassium. Let's see if that's true. Should sodium have a smaller radius than potassium? Does that satisfy the periodic trend? It does. If it's because sodium is above potassium. And sodium, that means that sodium uh, is filling the third orbital, n equals three. Potassium is filling the fourth one, that means size bigger. So that one's true. A neon atom has a smaller radius than an oxygen atom. So neon smaller than oxygen radius. Let's see. In this case, we're going side to side. So what's the trend there? Do they get smaller this way or smaller that way? 
mean, it's smaller that way, right? Why? Because the effective nuclear charge is increasing this way. You're at the same energy level. You're adding more protons. There's more positive charge drawing the electrons, so it shrinks. This one, smaller than that one. So that one's true. Uh, let's see. A fluorine atom has a smaller first ionization energy. And so we're switching gears. So fluorine, smaller than oxygen, um, first ionization energy. Is that true? Well, fluorine is to the right of oxygen. And what's the trend? Left to right, what happens? Ionization energy increases. Right? So that one's false. That one's backwards. It should be this way. First ionization energy of fluorine is greater than oxygen. For a similar reason to this, you've got a, a, a bigger effective nuclear charge in fluorine than you do in oxygen, which holds the electrons tighter. Takes more energy to get one loose. So we found the answer. But I'm going to go to this one. A cesium atom has a smaller first ionization energy than lithium. So it's smaller and lithium first ionization energy. Let's see if that's true. Is it easier to remove a cesium electron than a lithium electron? So here we're cesium. Wait a minute. That's cerium. Cesium. Here's cesium. There's lithium. So the ionization energy decreases go down okay. or increases as you go up. Why is that? That's true by the way. It takes less energy to remove an electron from cesium than it does from lithium because the starting position for the outermost electron of cesium is way out here and for lithium it's way down here. Right? So what I'm learning is that all your questions, E is not the answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So if E says all are true, it's wrong too. This is the best one. I got to do something about that, don't I? <laughs> no, you want to change it. Okay, 70, that was, that was 76. Yeah, 76. This is a simple one. We're kind of backtracking a little, little bit. That's 77. Um, which one of these electromagnetic radiations are arranged in order of decreasing frequency? Frequency gets smaller, which means wavelength gets longer. So decreasing frequency. How about visible ultraviolet X-ray? So if it's decreasing frequency, that means this will be less than that, and that'll be less than this. Okay, good. Decreasing frequency. Actually, that's reversed. Frequency is very high here, lower there, and even lower here. So that was false. How about uh, radio? Uh, visible and UV. That's wrong too. This is the lowest frequency of the bunch. And we just said that this one should be reversed. So it should go the other direction. 
How about C, ultraviolet, greater frequency than visible, greater frequency than infrared. That's true. This is the higher frequency. And remember, frequency translates into energy, right? They're right over here because I, I don't have enough room now. So if we know the frequency, we know the energy. So as frequency increases, energy increases. So you can think of it in that terms. Energy of UV is greater than visible, is greater than IR. That's true. And then just to be complete, D is X-ray visible UV. X-ray visible UV. Well, actually, yes and no, right? The, um, this does have a greater frequency than that one or that one. This one doesn't have a greater one than that one, right? So for that reason, that was false too. And then, uh, oh, we got an E. Gamma, let's see, all right, gamma. Gamma ray, greater than microwave, greater than visible. Okay. This is like D. Uh, gamma ray is greater than microwave and greater than visible. But microwave is less than visible. So that puts this one is wrong and this one is wrong. That's why those two are wrong. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got any? Any more strange things on here? I'm just going to make one up. This is discussion of the uh, second ionization energy. Which one has the greater second ionization energy? Um, lithium or beryllium? Right. Lithium has. Uh, 2s, 2, beryllium, uh, 1, excuse me, 1. Beryllium has uh, 2s, 2. So those are the valence electrons in those two. First ionization energy will be a little bit different. But what happens after you take get rid of this one? You're getting into one uh, S two. Now you're into the core. So the second ionization energy here is going to be extremely high, whereas the second ionization here is only is only going to be the other valence electron, right? So this one has a greater second ionization energy than beryllium because we're getting into the core. Okay. Let's see. Well, Thank you. 
There are some others in here, but they're they look like to me uh, uh, bonus candidates, like one nineteen. That would be a good candidate for a bonus question. Did we do that one in class already? Or am I thinking of a different class? I must be thinking of a different class. A 117. Maybe it's 117 that we did. Nobody knows. <laughs> Maybe I just dreamed it. Well, any other questions? Got a few more minutes. Let's see. Uh, we're going to have the exam on Monday. Yeah, exam on the 8th. And on the 10th, I think we're due for a lab, aren't we? Yes. On the 10th, we're going to do, uh, we're going to determine the molecular weight of citric acid by titration. So you have to do, first thing you have to do is standardize your base. What do I mean by standardize the base? So our base is going to be sodium hydroxide. So we're going to standardize it against acetic acid, right? So what do you get? Well, you combine sodium with acetate. <coughs> and that proton and that hydroxyl makes the water. So if we know the molarity of that one is that, and say we don't know this one, then if we put, say, 50 milliliters of this one in a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask, at that concentration, we know how many moles of protons we have in there. That's one to one. All right, so it would be 50 times this one. It would be so many moles of that one. Okay, let me give a calculator. We'll keep it real. Times. This would be 43.65 millimoles. I talked about millimoles yet? <laughs> okay. Let me explain myself. Normally, what you would do is convert that to liters, right? Because of the definition of molarity. If you convert this to liters, then you get 0 0.0436. Oh. Okay. But if you multiply, if you have um, um, molarity is equal to that many moles, uh, 0 0.873 moles per liter, how many moles do you have in a milliliter? Or about this wrong. No, how many millimoles do you have in a liter? Right? Milli is thousand. Right? So it'd be a thousand of them there. So that'd be uh, 873 millimoles in a liter. Right? So if you multiply that times 0 0.5, uh, 0.05. 
meters. Then you end up with 43.6 miles. All right, how do you use millimoles? Well, the simple thing, the, the easy answer is, if you multiply milliliters times molarity, you get millimoles. If you divide millimoles by milliliters, you get molarity. Right? Millimoles divided by milliliters. If we if we say uh, divide millimoles by L, right? make it moles. And divide milliliters by a thousand, make it liters. And so that's liters, and that's moles. Then you get molar. Either way. Okay? So we can say that if we put 50 milliliters of acetic acid in that Erlenmeyer flask, then we have, we add, say we add, um, Oh, let's say it takes 40 milliliters of this base, all right? So that means that we put the same number of moles, right? This is stoichiometry, one to one. So the same number of millimoles here is the same number of millimoles here. So if we divide that many millimoles by milliliters, we get 1.09 more. Why do we need to do that? Well, we're going to titrate citric acid with our base. If you don't know what the concentration of your base is, then that's the end of the story. You can't do citric acid, titrating it with this base. Now we know the concentration of the base. Absolutely. That may not be it. Right? You're going to find out when you do the, the lab. But now that we know this one, then we can react sodium hydroxide with citric acid. Let me see. I don't want to have to draw the structure out in order to get the formula. Okay, there's, there's citric acid. We know that citric acid has three protons. Notice that it's got hydrogen here too. Those hydrogens are stuck. You can't remove them with titration. These are the only three that you can do. Right? So now what is the stoichiometry? Well, we're gonna have three hydrogens. We need three hydroxyls. Right. This is going to be uh, three minus because you've got three pluses here. So this is going to be three sodium and then your H5 and then three waters. So there's your stoichiometry. At this point, we know the concentration here. Um, let's just say it's, uh, we determined it was that for our example. But citric acid is a solid, right? So you're going to weigh out so much of it. Let me see how much we're going to weigh out. Um, citric, no, that's not it. Citric acid. 27 grams. Okay, I'm going to weigh out that much. So, 
if we know we've got this many grams, it might not be exactly that, you know, but you're going to know exactly the four decimal places how much it is. And let's say it takes, well, I don't know, it'll take a certain amount of milliliters here. So if you know the molarity in the milliliters, then you do want to convert this one to liters. And you find out how many moles it takes, moles of sodium hydroxide. Then you convert your moles of sodium hydroxide that you titrated. I didn't describe titration, did I? Okay, let me back up. Here's the device. It's called a burette. It's got marks on it. The big marks are in milliliters. The little marks are in tenths of a milliliter. And they start from up here and they go down to here. Right? They start high at the top, low at the bottom. That's because you're going to deliver your base from this device. So if you start at zero and you end up at 20, you have delivered 20 milliliters. That's why it's reversed. But then we're going to have, we're going to have um, something here, right? In this case, it would be our citric acid in here. And we're going to have an indicator, phenolphthalein, that will change color when we reach our end point. Right? So you don't have to guess. Color change will tell you when you're there. So it takes so much of this delivered to neutralize that acid with this base. So if we know how many moles of sodium hydroxide, how many moles of citric acid do we have? Conversion factor time. That's abbreviated for citric acid. So how many moles of citric acid does it take? For every one of these, it takes three of those. So for this one, you just divide three into this one, that gives you the moles of citric acid. Now guess what? You've got moles, you've got mass, you can calculate molar mass. So you just take this mass, divide it by those moles, you have molar mass for that. That's your answer. And then you can calculate molar mass from that formula and compare it to the value you get. And you can say, you know, what percent error did I have in my experiment? If you get less than 5%, you're doing real good, especially on your first attempt. And that's all there is to that lab. Your end goal is the molar mass of citric acid. Okay. Oh, I'm out of time. Let me see. Do I have any, any things that I need to hand back? I want to keep carrying the great paper to with. Uh, oh, is Hannah still there? Yeah, Hannah. Uh, did you ever find those other pages? Yeah, I had the the last page. Yeah, I didn't do the bonus section. Okay, why don't you uh, put them together with with this and email them to me? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, that'll be fine. Just attach them to an email. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Let's see. No, not here. Not here. Not here. Yeah, I've still got a uh, an Excel with no nothing attached to it. Can you send that to me? I got you. I got you. Okay, we're done. Bye-bye. You too.
test is Monday, right? Test or is Monday. Monday. Yeah. Right. Test Monday. And meeting.